Hi, I'm Seamless, and today I'm going to show you how I did this. <laughs> Isn't that a lot of fun? At least it will be. Okay, so let's break that down after I finish breaking our minds. Okay, you can go up here and you can come down here, but not full screen. Hooray. Okay, so this is happening live, as you can see. So this isn't doing anything whenever I'm not pressing a note. That's what I was doing with the keyboard. You know, or just... I got the keyboard. Well, that was too high. Um, I have a patcher here with a bunch of controllers coming out of it, but all the controllers are being influenced by information coming from this business. However, this was easier said than done. So you can see how the colors are changing, and this is the principal way by which I'm determining that I'm doing, like, the XYZ thing. And it's not even really, really doing that. Um, <clears throat> it's not as direct as being like, I can be here, I can be there, whatever. And you've seen me do the normal XY calculations before. Problem with that is that I used a lot of layers, it, it meant a lot of connections, and if I screwed some stuff up, then that could just have been bad. This I got done with one layer. Um, plus, I mean, the rest of this is just a bunch of layers doing the processing, but the actual like color tracking business was meant that I could just put out those values out of the one layer that was doing it. So let's talk about how the layers are doing it. Yeah, up here we have a whole big line of stuff. So in the past, you've heard me big like, have complaints about uh, what happens when you have a lot of layers and then how it gets kind of unwieldy. And I've discovered the secret to working with it, which is that you don't do anything until you have all of the stuff you're going to use. And this can be hard if you don't already essentially know how to do what you're about to do. But you do this a few times and you get kind of used to the sort of things that do or don't work in sequence. And then the stuff that can get out of sequence, if you're not careful. Um, but mainly I didn't do much of any kind of buffer blending stuff until the very end after like I had already set all the layers, the, the, the layering is all done and I didn't have to go back and add new things and put new little intermediary nonsenses that would then just wreck the indexing list. And that's neither here nor there, because if you do just, it's like knowing what I needed to do, this is what I broke down. So you can kind of see the first step is I have a, I have a green piece of tape in my hand. <laughs> And um, I wonder how hard this will break everything if I actually just open up a new one to do this. Because this part, this is the, the second most important part of this basic concept is putting in uh, how, to make a, how to make a mask out of this. And the next most important part is what to do with it after the fact. And then the third most important part is how to blend it all together. So this is, how, this is actually how I start doing stuff with ZG at the moment. I create the video and hi, here I am. There's my hand, there's a green thing. And then here this is. And then I go to buffer. And now I didn't do anything. I just put the camera there. But the reason why is because I don't want to pull this particular layer from one ZGE more than one time. So this is in here now. And now I'm going to pull this layer every time I want to do some stuff with it. So like the example, the next thing I want to do with it is get this guy out. So now, because I'm a big fan of the corridor crew guys, I know what this is called. This is called Luma keying, what I'm about to do. Um, and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a hack to get chroma and luma keying at, done using only color correction because I'm I'm really interested in getting things like this done with just as little layering as possible. If I actually took the time to learn how to use the thing that makes this stuff, the actual Z game editor, I could just actually make a layer that does all the complicated versions of this in one layer, and I wouldn't have to care. But that's not that wasn't the design focus for any of this, so that's why none of that's like that. But here's what you do. Use another thing because I put the tape on my right hand and that's the hand I use for my mouse. So I use this thing for reference. Um, now, this could just be chroma because it is green. Nothing else in here is green. But the thing about the luminous, the luminous nest nest is that you can do some tricks based on some knowledge about spectral nonsense, which in particular is that there there's different powers to understand brightness or loudness to our brains on different places in the spectrum. Color is different places on the spectrum. So if I just jank it all up like this and we have super green you can kind of see there's still other sorts of greens going on in the scene back there but the reason that's not going to matter is because i'm only going to grab the green that's this green this hard this hard being this bright which is where the luma part comes in now 
normally, and by normally, I mean you'd use a piece of editor software that just could do this in their layers. But what we're going to do here is we're actually, we're going to hue it up until the green is blue. And the reason we're doing that is blue is going to signify a certain truth, which is that it's at the absolute highest end of the spectrum frequency wise. Yes, which means that it's apparent brightness is still there despite very low level, which is what we're going to do. We're going to go down now to the lowest level and literally just keep going down and look what's left, the blue stuff. And that's why we hue up like now, like whatever we want to hue up that like can fit that color. If we can make it bright enough to be actually act, like access there is how we identify uh, brightness and a color level that we can stitch out to be a mask, which is what we've now made. Uh, I go through the next the next step here of uh, making it white. It's because the communication of on off about what a mask is good for is about brightness. It doesn't care about color. You can make it care about color, but we're going to do that separately. Um, so full full blast, uh, gamma value, all saturation, and then boom, white. So now we have made the mask, and I'm going to name the mask. Uh, mask. Beginning. Ba bam We're not done yet. Now, this is where some stuff gets fun, because what I want to do is we're going to associate this position with a value and we're going to do that by associating the position with a color and we're going to do that by using a four corner gradient this is what the colors start off with and we're essentially going we're essentially going to do 2d normals which, which is that we're going to make a color that's representative of a particular location in the screen kind of i say kind of because this is all rgb based and that's three things so what's the fourth thing well the fourth thing is this is, is basically darkness and we're gonna do that by, by the opposite we're gonna make it light so we got rg and then b and of course it's not really b because it's the other guy was kind of b so it had to be farther from b that's why that and cool now we got this but what's neat is that it has a blending mode so if i go to multiply i want to play i think i want color straight up yeah there we go all right, so now you can kind of see the value of that. This is like, cool. Now, wherever I am on the screen, it's going to be, it's literally changing the color of my mask to determine that's now a new location. So that's sweet. Um, but if we were to actually come out here, so the, here's where, um, this is where this is, this is functional. This is the thing that shows us the values of the colors that we're looking at. And these are all output as uh, handles that can be accessed automation-wise. And there's one of these that gets put out for every individual buffer that you assign. And that's super handy, but as you can tell, the values are all ridiculously tiny if the, the percentage of screen I'm occupying is also ridiculously tiny. So this is where, this is, this is, this is the bit of buffuttery on my part because there's not really, like the better way to do this would be to do this and things that are meant to do this better. But the thought here is that I need to now make a big, big boomy, boomy thing happen so that um, its position takes up more of the space. There's, there's kind of more than one way to do this. The other way I could have done this is to do this part first, the bloomy part first, and then have the, the coloring color this. The problem with that is that if I'm way up here in red corner and I want to say the red value to be super represented, I need the bloom to bloom out from here and not actually bloom what's underneath where the bloom is because that's a different color. And it's it's closer towards the other colors, which makes the, the motion sort of infer differences. But I want it to be, I just wanted to represent the one color really well. Um... So to do that, I have to futz with positions and colors and focuses and stuff here, and then futz with positions and colors and focuses and stuff here. And even this is not going to really do the best ultimate job. Like we're gonna see this and get nice blue, red, and whatever, and it's kind of purple. And that, that's where the beginning starts to screw it up because it's I, there was color in that whiteness there, which means it'll never actually be completely white. But it does mean that we need to have representative values that we can actually kind of visibly see are different based on a different location in the screen. Now that's that's all well and good for like we can the, we can see that the the proof of concept works, but as far as having actual like an X Y Z controller, this is not really that because that's still not far enough away from each other to really adjust for that. At least in a really well made you know playing an instrument kind of way. And you'll note that the thing I made and demonstrated today was kind of screechy and weird. Um, and that's because that is a lot easier to me to just assign the values and move around and have it be like, yes, this is intentional. This is how this sounds, these corners of the screen, because it does sound like that way. And then I do have like full-ish XYZ control just for this thing I've created, but it isn't really 
as is in control as it looks, right? Now, let's go back to the other guy and explain what happens after this. After we've made the color coordinator, after we've linked to stuff, like here, here's where the thing is linked to, and here's what the linking looks like. Now, here's a, here's a bummer. Um, this does not rename based on when you rename the buffers. It does rename in here, and you can see you can get actual layers and names and whatnot. But uh, I have to actually count to figure out which one of these are what. And the way you count them is this is buffer one. This is buffer two. Buffer three. So the decoloration authorization is an indication of a new buffer. Four, five, six. And basically, like, buffer 11 is the one that has, like, the, the this guy. And that's this is the one that I decided to use for, um, oh, and now I have to come in here and reload the, the webcam. Um, every time I re-engage my webcam on something, it hangs it. But it'll unhang. Or maybe it won't. I might have just busted it. Yeah, that looks pretty. Well, huh, there's me. Is it going to do that thing where I have to? No, there's that. How you guys doing? Actually, okay, it is doing that thing. All right, so this is um a strange bug that pops up every once in a while where doing a th doing any actually this is probably because I turned on um recording. Oh no, I guess it didn't. Moral story is you fix this by uh reengaging whatever element like appears to be frozen, which is all of them. Perhaps. Hmm. And we're back. I loaded to an earlier save. All right, so now we're back to our, our dude, our original guy here. So here's the order from where we left off, where we've created the motion mask, where in here, that was here? Yeah, I called it motion hope because I wasn't 100% sure this was gonna work out exactly the way I wanted it to. So you can see it's kind of doing it. And uh, I didn't really use the color white in here to my advantage. Essentially what I did is I linked the RGB to the thing, uh, XYZ controller of this armor I'm using. And then I used, I mentioned uh, number buffer 11 here, which is this guy. Now, this is how you merge stuff together. Like, so here's the camera, right? And then the camera doesn't have this graphic in it, but you can kind of see how there's a black edge on the outside of it. And that's that's happening right now because I'm actually, I have a, a copy of this whole it, like effect occurring right now, but saturated down and it'll be black and white and then valued up to be the, the thing that's being taken away from the mask, which I think I can show you without killing things. Um, bam. Yeah, so here's what has to happen before you can add together the actual final bit. You have to make a hole for it to exist. <coughs> Ugh, excuse me. Um, If you're familiar with like just doing add mode stuff and just putting things on the things you, you noted that what add mode does is that it doesn't take away what's beneath it it adds to it unless that addition is solid it won't appear solid you'll see behind it so if i don't want to see behind it if i just want to see and like by the way this effect where there's like you can see my hand in there that is a process within it to make it appear that that's there um but in order for it to appear like nice and solid and cool and, and the color that it looks like when it's by itself it has to be added onto nothing or calculated upon nothing. I say calculated because I'm using lighten. I just I just like using lighten. You can use you can use that. It's mine. Like we. Yeah. Bam. Yeah. So what comes in? So this, this color dodge thing is that. So you see how my hand kind of glows before it shows up. That's actually the separate process to make that happen because it looks sort of weird for this naked green thing to show up whenever the thing doesn't have doesn't show up fast enough. Um, that uh. That's what that layer is done to do the fix. But everything else is stuff I've done before and shown, which is really like, okay, I made I made that uh, motion hope. <laughs> and then I have this next layer that's important. So then these, these three dudes are the things I'm using to create the changes that you see to the signal. You can kind of see the sinusoidal warp occur in the smoke. You can see it like, <laughs> my chair is kind of green, so it's showing up. The reflections in here. Yeah. This guy is responsible for like the kind of smoky background. Like this guy is creating the kind of fiery texture, and this dude is making like a kind of smokage upward crawl. And they're all like layered and multiplied upon each other into each other. And um, primarily, like the layer that comes out. So you see this 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 dude here. That's what that looks like. This this one is called bright hand because it doesn't have the trail. It's the one that actually sticks to the hand. And. Uh, for the, like for the most part, that's what like the, that bright paper we're looking at there is the thing that's processing originally for it to show up there so that it appears there's a 
object in the hand. And then the trails after that. So this visually is very similar to creating like a percussion sample where you make a transient that happens immediately and then the tail and the body that follows for it to occur and appear as though it's a realistic thing that occurred. And uh, after this, we have the blur version of it. Now, this is this is how we get the tail. This is just this little visual equivalent of a reverb, a delay, where there's a frame blur where instead of it immediately going away the next frame, the frame, eh, 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 eh. And each frame after it's doing that, so that's how you get this tail. And then the tail itself is getting itself processed by the same processes again from the same layers, the same other dudes and whatnot. And one of the layers that's doing the processing is also the camera itself. You can see the hand showing up. Like when my other hand is interacting in there, this is because the regular ass layer A camera layer is part of the, one of the pixelate layers in the thing, and there it is. It's influencing the shape of the element in real time because of that, along with the other ones that are also influencing in real time, and they just happen to be these noise patterns. Generative nonsense all the way. Further, uh, I saved a little bit of effort by doing this image row, which is all of the bodies built together. It's the main layer, the main, the main mask, the main hand element, and then the main tail all adding together. And then I did a little bit of extra processing on top of this, which is basically the visual equivalent of doing a bus. And uh, all of this together is the thing that got put into what's called Big Hand, because it's all the stuff together. And then there's the sub mask, which is the thing that comes out of here and then gets color corrected. And now also because it's color corrected to it just be white with no color change and only show up when it's there, it's also the layer I'm using to determine the volume for the element when I play it, which is, so here, nothing. See the, still nothing. <laughs> this is before or after I made the automation. There you go. Oh, cause I clicked on that derp. So what's also cool is that if I can strategically visually make the thing fill up the screen, that will mean that it's calculating more of the thing in the screen, therefore it will be louder. And that's basically also true for the color correction stuff, for the, the color differences in the change of motion. Which let's I'll, I'll show you what I've linked them all to just to show you why it's all chaotic. So these three guys, this is that that layer's brightness total just by itself, and then RGB of the motion hope layer. Then uh, they're all reconnected into here, and this is this is pitch, and so not only do I have mod X doing pitch, but look how far mod X goes. It's not very. That's as far as that goes typically, um, and I also have Y and Z also kind of competing in different shapes and whatevers, because I wanted it to be uncertain. I didn't really want it to be like, I, I wanted to be different. Is really actually what I meant to say. I wanted it to be uh, actual unique feeling and setting everywhere on the screen. What's cool about trying to do this with, like, you know, using the visual nonsense to make it happen is that um, even no matter what weird settings I pick, no matter what nonsense comes out, it'll be the same nonsense everywhere I am, everywhere, every time I'm there like that. Because this is a value, and then that's a value. And, like, if I put it between two stupid things, it'll be the same stupidity no matter how I do it, which is what makes it performable, ideally. <laughs> um... Yes, and then I, I also attached it to other high sort of uh, damage parameters like the prism, big one here, and also uh, the bandpass. The bandpass is also being independently automated through here to make it uh, be the volume, to kind of match with the volume motion. So that when the volume comes off, it kind of comes down with it. it. It makes it feel slightly more natural. And then reverb and compression so that we can hear it, but like... The I mean, I don't actually think I did compression. Nope, I didn't do anything. I didn't get to that part because I, I realized why it was so quiet in the first place. I just linked the naked, this value, the, the visual light value from that one layer directly to volume. And even that, this is not a very high amount. This is, this is the volume. That lower dot down there is the real input value. That's how high this is getting based on my motion. So also what's fun is note that it's moving a lot. This is something that like I might attempt in other versions, right? So essentially we're tracking one portion, one portion of one thing, but how cool would it be to be able to be like, oh, the stereo left, right, it can tell. And then like, it's smoky and weird, so it, will it be different? And then will the difference change at the rate that you can visually see it change? That's the same kind of detail problem, right? Like this isn't just a solid orb 
sphere that's just on and off. It has like all these qualities to its positional kind of reality. And if if that's the case, can I have its visual sort of type of motion be something that translates and looks like it, it it's part of something? And I have thoughts on how to utilize color and color data to kind of like make that happen. And maybe even make it happen for multiple channels. But yeah, this is where I am with this now. This. What's really neat is that if I hide the thing, it stops. You do it enough and you can predict the motion it'll cause and you can perform it. Like a weird, strange instrument. Not bad for webcams. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all of that fun stuff. And as usual, have a nice day.